Okay, so everybody's been muted. If you would like to speak as a board member, uh, we'll ask you to unmute, do, um, speak, and then we'll um, have you put the mute back on. And then when we get to some of the presentations, if the chair is going to allow for some question and answer, we'll have the same type of format. It is now 10.15, and the uh, number two is the prayer on the agenda. Do I have a motion for approval? So you have So moved. And say so this is Nicholas. Nicholas, and so moved. Thank you, Mr. Lampson. Call for a second. Okay. Go away about a second. And seconded by Mr. Uh, Deming. Have you got that uh, in, our, in our minutes? Thank you. Uh, all in favor of Mr. Lampson, say aye. Aye. Inside. Motion carried. We have a pretty short agenda. We have a couple of presentations uh, that will take a little bit of time. But we'll probably for about an hour and a half of time. Number three would be approval of the minutes of our March 10th meeting. I'm not sure everybody's had a chance, but uh, so moved. Second. Uh, moved by Supervisor Demery. Call for a second on approval. Second, Phil Oliva. Seconded by Supervisor Oliva. Any questions? Hearing none, call for approval. Motion carried. And there is an amendment to the mark. Tanya, I'll let you go through the amendment. Well, maybe Supervisor Pritchett would like to go through his comments. I did print copy hard copies for the screen. Um, and we can pull those up and share those on the screen. So the um on the WebEx So Supervisor Pritchard, I'll turn it over to you. We won't we won't have the addition out loud we we'll give you a chance to look at it as presented. So can everybody see? No, you can't see. No, cannot see. Frank Larson. How about now? Got him now. Okay. Okay, so Supervisor, you want to walk us through this? Supervisor for Well, Tanya, I think we can, I think you can read that then if we have a such difficulty. Okay, so I'll read this for the board members. Uh, Supervisor Pritchard did submit some um, edits to the minutes. Uh, I will read them for you now. Um, so, regarding the March 10th, 2020 meeting, I would like to propose the following additions, corrections to the 310 draft minutes. Page one, the last line, we would like deleted, um, have something written up, and for the deletion, include a written memorial in the minutes. Page two, at the first line of page after motion, resolve. County Health and Human Services Board does hereby memorialize, with heartfelt thanks, the dedicated and valuable services provided by the late Dr. Dr. David Markert and the late Pete Ray as citizen members of the board. 
page two, ten lines from the top, delete the sentence beginning with discussion regarding and insert, in quotes, uh, Public Health Director Kazmarski had a conflicting meeting about pandemic matters during this part of the meeting, end quote. Page two, following the preceding insert, add, Pritchard reported receipt of a copy of a February 25th letter to the county administrator from three supervisors of Lake Town Township regarding cancellation of a publicly scheduled presentation by Public Health Director Kazmarski to Lake Town's moratorium on livestock facility, facility licensing committee. In parentheses, the letter showed copies to all Polk County supervisors and three staff members but had not yet been delivered to them, end of parentheses. This cancellation was discussed, and Corporation Council Malone confirmed she requested the cancellation for legal reasons, parentheses, that there were not, that were not discussed at the board meeting, end of parentheses. Um, page two, following the previous insert, add, after discussion, it was agreed Kazmarski would make a presentation of CAFO health issues based on his presentation to the ES committee at the next Health and Human Service Board meeting. Page two before items for next agenda add Health and Human Service Board 2020 work plan. Pritchard re requested two additions to the draft 2020 work plan, the Polk County Housing Study and looking at getting public transportation in the county. So I'll let you Dr. So, <laughs> Supervisor Sonoprise. Tanya, Tanya, are these just comments uh, about the minutes, or do they have to be initiated as part of the minutes? Well, I think you guys need to agree to the corrections, and then we can correct the minutes, make an amended minute, minutes then. So should I call for a motion to accept the comments and as addition to our minutes as so do you need yeah do you need a motion and then um, you can open it up for discussion okay does somebody want to move to add uh, those comments to our march 10th um, as it was presented you want to you made the original motion uh joe so did you want to accept that as uh Part of our March 10th. Agreed. Okay, we will we'll call for a separate motion for addition to the minutes. Does anybody want to present that? Nick Larson would like to uh, make a motion to take that, put them in the minutes of the meeting. Thank you, Supervisor Larson. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, no way. I have a second to the uh, addition. Bill? Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, did you second that bill or Yes, I did. Any other further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Hearing negative. Hearing that motion is passed. Uh, comments so will be added to our March uh, and uh, moving on to uh, I think there is some people who uh, I think we can come and comment me of our communication so if you want to call in on the time Hopefully, uh, these comments will be specific to the agenda as presented and to the minutes of our previous meeting. 
call for public comment. Introduce us. And uh, your municipality that you live there. Was there a gentleman from Eureka that uh, had called in? Yes, I'm here. This is Bill Marson, a supervisor with um, Eureka. Uh, I'm, I'm really getting a lot of static, so I can't really understand what's going on. I hope you didn't hear you, Bill, so uh, just go ahead and uh, welcome to our, to our meeting. Uh, you know, I've, said, I've attended many, many meetings with the Fort County Board and many other meetings with the uh, Health and for Services and Environmental Committee for COVID. And I'm really concerned about what's going to happen over the CAFO thing and, and how the county is going to react to all of this. And my concern is that 80% of the people in Polk County do not want hog tables in this area. And we're re really concerned about if we're going to turn Polk County into a little China or if we're going to end up like they are in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or in the Carolinas, or even in Iowa. We don't want these people here, and what it does to our environment, uh, I'm just, I think I'm just I mean, truly tell that people do that. something about it, and take the, all the people that yeah. live in our yeah. county to heart in what we want to, to have done. And that, that ends con comment. Thank you for letting me talk. Question. Thank you, um, uh, Bill, and uh, our and supervisors. We aren't allowed to comment on anything, uh, public comments, but uh, our administrator, Vince Morgan, uh he can probably give you some comments. Of, uh, yeah. There's been a lot of uh, people in the administration and supervisors that have attended meetings and attended meetings outside of the county? Yes. Uh, according to our uh, council, uh, the administrator is not allowed to comment either, uh, but the door to the uh, county administrator and, and the offices are open. And you can come in and discuss it. And um, so that's the procedure on that, Bill. Any further oh, comments? You know? Any further comments from the public? Hi there. Hi, my name is Emily Hanson. May I be next to speak? You may. Welcome to the agenda. Hi. Um, so I'll have to leave after the public comments um, session. Thank you for being open to trying to host a meeting during this strange time. Um, my comment is that I would urge the board uh, bravely to slow down on the process of trying to make, um, to move forward with um, with things right now regarding CAFOs. We're obviously in the midst of a pandemic in which many of us are, um, we are all at home and I think it is very clear at this moment that the link between large-scale agriculture, animal agriculture, and uh, threats to human health are very strong. I am glad that you'll be hearing from a public health official later in this meeting, um, and I think that it is a very clear signal to all of the citizens of Polk County as well as to you, the board, that we need to... Um, put very strong restrictions on large-scale animal agriculture, um, specifically hogs, uh, in this county because, yes, some of these most dangerous um, epidemics that have happened in the last several decades have come from jumping from animals to humans, um, mostly as a result of confined conditions. And the, the epidemic we're seeing right now um, the, the health impacts on workers who are in essential services such as agriculture and who are working in confined conditions like in slaughterhouses, um, processing animals, it is, it is causing 
havoc on our system, and we need to we need to not have that disaster in our county. We need to be working towards a type of agriculture that is going to be resilient in these types of situations when they arise again in the future. So I, my comment is I would urge the board to continue the moratorium, hear from the, um, from the public health official, Brian, who's going to be speaking later, and really consider strongly um, outlying CAFOs, hog CAFOs in our region. You've got a hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your for your concerns and your voice. Uh, like I said, we had a lot to comment, but your your uh, comments are recorded and are in a point of record. Any other public comments? May I speak, please? You may introduce yourself, please. My name is Shelly Giswold. I'm a Lake Town Township resident. Um, some of my comments are concerning the CAFO issue also. Um, I have spoken to both uh, Chris Clayton and Jeff Jackson from the DNR state and county and talked to them about the, the president lightening up supposedly on the EPA regulations and my concerns about whether that's going to impact um, what the regulations are going to be how stringent they're going to be able to be in our county. I'm very concerned about the health implications for our residents. Uh, those, those DNR gentlemen both told me that they were very concerned. Um, they didn't hear anything that was going to change at this point because of the president's changes, but they were very concerned about not having the manpower uh, due to all the cutbacks, um, to be able to regulate the uh, concentrated animal feeding operations and that they were very uh, overloaded and that these, these places are self-regulating. Um, my other comment is about what happens because there's no plan, as far as we've heard, for the future about what happens when processing plant like in Sioux Falls, Smithfield, is shut down for whatever reason where all the pigs coming from this area would be processed. So at a rate of a thousand pigs that's being born per day per facility, that means there's an awful lot of pigs that are going to need processing on a regular basis. And what happens when the processing plant can't process due to shutdown? So that's a major concern of mine, um, and I would really urge you to go forward in, in finding out all the information from the public health director and listening to the concerns based on everything that we've been talking about in the past as far as our water, air, health concerns, and what the possible future looks like for us in this county. And we really appreciate you putting this meeting on for us. So I, I, those are my comments. Thank you very much, ma'am. Once again, uh, everything will be recorded as a point of interest. Uh, any further public comments there? And we do very much welcome the voice of our constituents. The, uh, all of us will have three new supervisors on our next session. But, uh, our uh, monthly meetings of the Polk County Board is always open to the public and we reach, uh, as much participation in our county government as possible. So thanks again. Any other further comments? Yes, this is Chris Clark, and I have to go into an appointment really soon. Um, you know, I just second what has uh, already Chris, been where said. Is your, uh, where's your address? Lake Town. Lake Town. Town. Lake Town. Quick Thank name, Yep. Go ahead. And I, I mean, as a 30-year veteran of um, health care work, I can say I'm very, very concerned about the health implications of making a decision to have 
something like this is just in light of what the other two callers have said. And, um, you know, I just feel like um, this is such a strong and important time for us to really consider how we go forward in life um, to keep everybody healthy and happy. And also because I don't think these large corporations are sustainable economically as well. And I I also believe that it will impact property values even more considering what's going on. And um, I need to go to my appointment, so thank you for listening and thank you for what you do. Thank you very much, Chris, for your comments and interest in, uh, in government and your participation. Any further comments? Uh, you can hear the comments very loud and clear uh, in, in our county boardroom, so I hope all you folks on the uh, on the phone lines can hear also. Any hey, further I'm comments? Uh, may I speak? Uh, who is this? Uh, my name is Patrick McElhone. You Patrick live in yeah. uh, Proceed. Uh, where's your identification? I, I live in Eureka Township. Eureka Township. Thank you, Pat. Uh, 220,000 piglets per year from the Cape Town. 19,000 piglets per month that will be moved to local farmers to finish for market. What this means is there will be more pollution to our area for what? So a Chinese company can feed the rest of the world at our expense. 31,000 pounds of dead pig compost at the Cape Town per year, not to mention the manure waste that will spread to adjacent peoples. Property values will decrease around the table and so will the tax base. It is beyond incredible that you allow this to happen to our part of the world. Look what Walmart did to small businesses in downtown St. Croix Fall. A capo will cause the same thing to happen to a small pig farmer. Please do not let this happen. My rights extend only until they interfere with the rights of others. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your comments will be in a point of record. And remember, again, as supervisors, we aren't willing to comment on the, on the uh, uh, public comments. However, uh, I, I do remind you folks that the Polk County Board has passed a extended moratorium. And... Uh, I hope that uh, everyone can get a copy and be familiar with that. Maybe some of them know the Any further public comments out there? Yeah, yeah, uh, comments? yeah, this, yeah John, this is Randy Clark from Eureka Township. Well, I'd like to just... Uh, I would like to ditto the last three comments there, people that stood up there and talked, because uh, we're on the verge of polluting our water tables here by allowing something like this to come in here. So we really got to take it to heart what we're going to do for our future here. So uh, just keep it in mind that these comments are very, very serious. It, it, and what we're trying to do here is to prevent this from happening. So. Uh, I'll end it with that. Once again, thank you, Mr. Clark. <laughs> Any further comments? Public comments? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is Howard Paul uh, from Frederick, Great Lake area. Thank you. And something, something that uh, I would recommend that the, the board members do, uh, there's some very good research papers done by the Center for Disease Control on uh, CAPOs. Uh, John Hopkins also has a research paper that is very good, uh, and this is uh, regarding the health issues on CAPOs. And the Iowa Policy Project also has a very readable paper uh, that Tells what these large hog capos have done to the state of Iowa in regards to water pollution, uh, and, and economics. Uh, and uh, those papers are very readable, 
And I think every board member should uh, take about 45 minutes and read each one. They, they take about 45 minutes. They're easy to read, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, once again, it will be entered as a point of interest. Any further public comments? You know where to get comments at the um, shop? You can. I I'm the address. You won't. Um, he actually wants to be checked up in the next like 20 minutes. Uh, I can tell you where he is. Uh, hearing, has anybody had a chance to speak out there in public comments? Hearing then we will close, we will close the public comment section. Thank all you folks for our interest and. I'm oh, sorry, I was. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to unmute myself. I would like to make a short comment, if that's okay, Joe. Welcome. Go ahead. Proceed. Probably. Oh, thanks. Uh, my name is Kathleen Colbert. I'm in Blackbrook Township, and I just wanted to echo what Hampson said earlier about thinking about this time of during a pandemic when our whole way of life has been completely changed and I would prefer that this not happen in the future and it does seem like these major pandemic diseases have to do with confined animal operation. So do we really, the question I'm thinking about is do we really want to live in a future where we're gambling the possibility of this being a more regular occurrence, I would I would prefer that to not happen. And it just seems logical to me that when you can find anything into a small space, you're going to catch diseases even when you think about towns, you know, and, and cities a long time ago when people weren't taking care of their race and humans weren't taking care of their race in a safe way, people got sick. And so I think it's kind of the same thing with animals. And we do, obviously, capos have regulations in place, and but it does seem, as another call was saying, that the DNR doesn't have the capabilities to be checking up on these people, on, on the capo farms all the time. And I don't think that capo farmers are all trying to not follow the regulations, but some of them aren't. Some of these are larger companies who don't necessarily care about the land or the area or the people around them. And when you have that many animals, I don't know how you could keep track of every little regulation. And if a big spill happens, I'm not confident that they're going to report it because it's happened in the past. And so I just Personally, would prefer to move forward into a future where we're going to be trying to be healthier and be less combined. And I appreciate the extended moratorium. I appreciate um, this meeting. And it does seem like there has been a rush in this process. Even I kind of feel like I'm really glad that it's meeting today and make this technology work. but. I still think it's kind of unacceptable for some people, and so I wonder why not wait to share this this information when people could come in person. And so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interest, your voice. Any more public comments that you'd like to speak? All three times. Any more public comments? Any more public comments? Or we will close and move on to our agenda. Number five, uh, program overview, Great River Income Maintenance, Diana Peterson. Would you like to uh, speak to this? Uh, introduce your gal time. Okay, yep, I will introduce Diana, but first, could we have Mike Pritchard um, speak up so we can identify you? 
I'm here. Can you hear me? Hello? Yep, we got you. Are you hearing me? Can you hear us? Good. I, I can hear you. I tried several times to speak up earlier, and uh, anyway, you can hear me now. That's good. We okay. can hear you now. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Can you talk can to you me? You need a pass? Okay. All right, so Diana, Diana Peterson is our economic support supervisor here in Cook County. Uh, we are part of a uh, 10th County Consortium um, that administers public benefits for Medicaid, Badger Care, Food Care, um, and we just wanted to bring some information to you on what it all looks like here in Polk County. So I'll turn it over to Diana. Good morning. So it's been uh, probably two, three years since I've done a presentation uh, in regards to Thank you. support and the Great River oh, Consortium. So just wanted to give you guys some data today um, as to where we are at um, as far as our staffing, um, numbers as far as statistics within our programs specific to Polk County for the most part. Um, so for Polk County, I have 12 staff. And they are broke down into teams. Um, Amir is our energy assistance worker. And then I have a family team slash child care team. And then our elderly, blind, and disabled team as well. Um, of that staff, I currently have three brand new workers in training um, due to a number of retirements that I've had within our unit in the last couple of years. Uh, for the Great Rivers Consortium, uh, we are a community consortium, which is, uh, includes Barron, Burnett, Chippewa, Douglas, Dunn, Eau Claire, Pierce, Polk, St. Croix, and Washburn County. Um, so we, um, our directors all meet as well as um, and our managers for the consortium. And then again, we are broken down into special team care programs between our family team and our elderly blind and disabled team a child care team, and our benefit recovery team. And for me, in particular, I manage um, our 12 staff here in Polk County, but I'm also a facilitator of the consortium child care team, um, which is another 19 staff. So just some fun facts about the consortium for those that maybe really don't understand how we operate. Um, again, we are 10 counties. Um, Oakland County is our fiscal agency. Um, each consortium back in 2012 got to decide how they wanted the model to be as far as the um, program. And we chose to have a one-stop shop concept for our consumers with our call center being our primary focal point. Um, so our call center does operate uh, five days a week. Two of those days are from 8 to 4.30 and Wednesdays from 8 to 11. And in that call center setting, consumers can call to apply for benefits, do their renewals, ask them more questions. Um, a variety of tasks are handled through that call center setting. Then each county is to offer a minimum of, of 35 hours per week of lobby service in each of our local agencies, which we do per our federal administrative memo. And in our lobbies, we all have to have a computer so people, consumers can come and apply online, or they can use a telephone that has a direct dial to our call center as well and a direct line to the food share quest card line. Um, between our 10 counties, we have roughly 55,000 cases in our geographical area. We have currently 110 workers in our consortium, 12 are managers. We currently have 13 vacancies. Seven of them, 13, have been on hold for um, quite a long time. Um, the directors um, have kept those on the books, so in times where um, we may have an increase in these goals, and we would be able to potentially fill some of those positions as well. 
A big part of our design is we have our a lead team. Um, so we have nine family workers that are considered our leads and six from our elderly, blind, and disabled. And we consider them to be experts in um, our programs, and so staff are able to reach out to them through our call center as well, where we administer a lead line. Um, our directors meet quarterly, and our the managers meet twice, two times a month, usually one in person in Barron, which is our kind of our center county for us, Ken. And then we usually do one via WebEx a month as well. Um, currently, under the COVID-19 pandemic, we are meeting twice a week um, just to stay on top of things. Um, for our consortium at the Midwest Partners Conference in August of every year, um, the last two years, our consortium has received two awards, one for our application processing timeliness and as well as our error rate. So as I said, our call center is our focal point for our consortium. And I so the data that I'm providing is over a three-year period for most of our programs. And I just want you to note that total calls received per year in 2019 were 188,995 calls. Um, so our staff spend 50% of their day in a call center setting and then the other 50% of their time doing case management work. Um, we, so we feel that our call center has been very successful. Um, other data on there is going to be regarding our answer rate, our average speed of answer, and how long our agents are on the phone. And those um, are recorded because of our performance standards with the state of Wisconsin. Um, we do have to meet certain criteria to maintain our call center. So for our consortium, our average speed of answer is going to be three minutes, um, which is well below the standard um, for answer. Uh, energy assistance, uh, a little bit about that program. Um, it is a program to help with uh, contributing towards an individual's uh, electric bill or their heat bill. Uh, an offshoot of that program also is our furnace repair and replacement program, and we currently here in Polk County contract that out to um, West Cap out of Glenwood City. Uh, energy assistance across the state is operated by the agency, not by the consortium. So you will notice over the three-year period, we have had a little bit of a reduction in caseload over a three-year period. So in 17, we had six. 1,500 recipients. Um, in 19, we had 14, just a little over 1,400. Our fiscal year for this program runs October 1st to May 15th. Um, I would, our biggest um, reasons for a reduction in households that have received, we have a high elderly population in this county, and the elderly population um, is a, a big part of our energy assistance program. So we've seen, unfortunately, a lot of deaths over the last couple of years of ongoing recipients for this program, um, as well as a number of them move into their nursing homes or into um, assisted living. So that has been a quite, pretty big reduction in um, why we've had some reduction in numbers with our energy assistance program. Um, in this program, we do receive funding for the position, and um, if we run over on that, obviously that's tax levied. Uh, we do a really good job, though, of trying to, to only spend out what we're given from the state to administer this program. Uh, next is our food share program, and again, these are numbers for Polk County. Uh, you'll see that um, our average case count for 2019 was 1,669 a month with um, roughly 3,236 recipients. You're going to notice that there's been a big reduction in the benefit issuance for this program for Polk County. So in 2019, $3.8 million in food share was issued out for Polk County. Uh, this is roughly 7.3% of our population here in Polk County based off of the 2010 census. 
Um, some of the factors in why the food share program has seen a reduction uh, primarily has been um, from a new rule that was implemented a couple of years ago where child, childless adults or single adults that don't have exemption for our program can only receive food shares three months out of a 36-month period. So we had a number of recipients that maybe were on for three months and now they're sitting out for that, the remainder of that 36-month period. So that's pri primarily why we've had such a big reduction in benefits here. Our Medicaid program is probably our most complex program that we administer, and because it covers a wide variety of um, consumers and our program rules are different for all of these programs. So we break down between our family programs, which are going to be our Badger Care Plus program and our family planning, and then we go to our elderly, blind, and disabled population, which are going to be those individuals receiving SSI or over age 65 who are also disabled. And so there are various programs that for the elderly, blind, and disabled that are asset-based as well as income-based. So Medicaid expenditures, they track that for the counties as well. Uh, 2019 expenditures weren't yet available for us for um, this year, but for 2018, you'll see that we had 58 million just in, um, for county Medicaid expenditures. Um, the recipient count again has dropped off from 17, where we were at seven, just over 7,800. This Last year, we were only at 6,600, and again, the big decline for that is that um, we changed the income limits to 100% of the FPL for adults, and so we had a number of a childless adults and adults with children in the home drop off of the Badger Care program. My Wisconsin Child Care is our child care subsidy program, and You'll see with this program, it's totally the opposite. We had a huge increase in um, expenditures for 2019 for Polk County. Um, and that comes from the CCDBG block grant from back in 2014 under uh, President Obama that we needed to change how we looked at child care in the state of Wisconsin, um, have it mirror the private sector, um, and have parents that are on the subsidy program more responsible for their dollars and how they spend out child care. Um, we also changed our um, income limit format so that we went through uh, what they call periods. So we had a stabilization period, we have a gradual phase out period, and then we have our exit period. So our, we are able to keep individuals on the child care program even if they make more money for a longer period of time, where under old rule, if you were at 200% uh, of property, we just kicked you off. So this was a way to really keep children in care, um, have continuity of care, and then allow our parents time to um, make more money and before they would go off of the program. Um, and then a big piece of what we do is our benefit recovery program. Um, we have a team for our consortium, and their job every day is to do uh, prevention, program integrity, recoup monies that um, people, consumers receive that maybe they weren't entitled to. And so I broke down for Polk County, and you'll see that in 2019, um, total overpayment for Polk County consumers was $240,000. And so that is money that's sitting out there um, to be repaid by our consumers. Uh, the big piece of our benefit recovery program is once claims start coming back in for repayment, uh, we receive 15% of that back in as revenue. And what we, a big part of what we do also is we want to look at our total future savings. So by um, catching the error or the unreported income or the 
underreported income, then we look at future savings and what we would have, what we potentially would have paid out on top of the overpayment. But by catching, we look at our future savings. So that's also on there as well. And then we break down between our um, various reasons why we had the overpayment. Was it agency error? Was it fraud? Was it front end verification? So we're able to really um, go down deep to see why we had these errors. I can tell you the bulk of our errors in, our, or the bulk of our overpayment reasons um, in our consortium come off of our uh, SWICA discrepancies, which our um, employers report to Diller quarterly, and so then they match with what we have for income for red, um, consumers. And if there's a discrepancy of no reported income or underreported income, then we do investigations on that. And that's where the bulk of these come from. And then you'll see I also have on here for the Great Rivers Consortium and for overpayments for all 10 counties in 2019, we were over $2.6 million in recovery. So obviously over the last few weeks here, we've had a lot of policy changes um, due to the COVID-19 um, specific to economic support. So our staff, their heads are spinning. It seems every day we have uh, a new temporary policy coming out. So what I did is I broke it down by a program, what is happening with our policies um, during this time. So for food share, um, we waived the work requirements, so therefore nobody can be sanctioned for not cooperating with work requirements. Um, all renewals for March and April and May have been extended out three months, so we're currently not doing reviews on a group of people. All food share cases with a six-month report form that we're due in March, these were also extended out three months. April, there is no six-month report form. Drug testing for drug felons is temporarily suspended. Our food share ABOD population, which is our um, childless adults, they do not need to meet the standard work requirement. Uh, just the other day, so Monday, um, anybody that um, was on food share in March and April received a supplement to their food share card to bring them to the maximum food share allotment for their household size, regardless of what income they have in that household. Um, an example of that would be a household of one. Um, a lot of our individuals with household of one receive $16 a month if they have income. Um, they were supplemented up to $194 a month. So that will continue right now um, for March, April, and potentially May. And then we've waived the food share interviews for applications and renewal. So an individual can just apply and not have that interview and be found eligible for the food share program. And then instead of requiring verifications, we are able to use best available information to do that. So several big changes in the food share program. Healthcare, our uh, primary goal is to keep everybody open on their bachelor care or their Medicaid, so we're um, not dropping people off due to their extension sending and things like that. Um, work requirements for the MAP program, which is our Medicaid purchase plan program for our disabled individuals. We, um, they are not required to work there one hour a month. And then all healthcare renewals, again, were extended out three months. And then premiums for our Badger Care Plus children and our MAP individuals um, are being suspended until further notice as well. On um, child care, um, this child care is operated by DCF where our other programs are under DHS. So for DCF, um, we are actually paying both open child care providers as well as closed providers. So. If you had a case where your provider had to close due to COVID-19, which is their choice, we are still paying that closed provider as well as paying the provider that you had to select to um, utilize. So we're kind of paying out double money right now for that. Um, renewals, again, were extended. 
we extended all authorizations to June 30th for parents, even if they're not working. Um, and for those parents that are working, we extended their authorizations to 8831, so we're ensuring that um, they are able to continue using daycare. Um, a big part of what DCF did for COVID-19 is they created a website specific to our essential workers. Um, and Child Care Resource and Referral out of Eau Claire is assisting individuals in our area to find daycare, in particular our essential worker population. And then there were many um, executive orders that the governor put in place for our child care providers. Um, extending some of their um, really stringent rules and, and allowing them to operate in other locations and things like that. And then for our energy assistance program, we've always had a three-month income limit eligibility criteria. Now we're just doing it one month. And then the state did a mass mailing to um, all recipients for the last couple of years that haven't applied um, to try and urge individuals to apply for a program. And then the Public Service Commission extended the moratorium for our Class A utilities so that they couldn't, cannot disconnect this suite on the 15th. Um, Polk Burnett in our county is not part of a Class A utility as their co-op owned. Um, and I have been in contact with um, the, their um, administration as well, and they are going to follow that recommendation from the Public Service Commission as well. Any questions? Yeah, this is Mick Larson speaking. Um, my question is, have you seen um, uh, an increase in the number of people that have applied for these, for these services? And if so, what are you doing about it? So we are tracking, our Canadian has been tracking um, daily applications since the beginning of March um, and comparing them to the same time period for 2019 just to see um, how it is affecting our consortium as a whole. Um, I've been working with Don from uw as well um, on a grant that they are working on in particular in the way um, to see about how our five counties in the United Way, um, these applications are affecting us. And between the five counties, which are Pierce, St. Louis, Hope, Washburn, and Burnett, um, just over the last few weeks, we had a 28% increase in um, our applications for the five counties. So we are tracking that every day. Um, and the consortium obviously will have that data as time is on. Um, the biggest part about the application piece of it, because so many of the other things that were part of our staff management time have been waived or postponed, it's allowed our agents in the call center to be in the call center more to pick up that have extra applications that are um, being submitted by our agents. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and your continued uh, supervisor Larson. And uh, thank you for your dedication the last few years on the board. You're retiring from that. And go back. And Ms. Peterson, you focusing your understanding and dedication to this uh, great uh, project and you know, Project in Polk County is really above and beyond any, uh, any job position. Uh, very much. <laughs> Tanya, did you have anything to comment further uh, now, or should we move to uh, number six, our presentations and recommendations? I just want to say that Diana and her team um, do a wonderful job. They're in the community. 
Imagine make your job easier than being the boss lady that who has some co-workers like that. They're outstanding. Number six is presentation and resolutions. Uh, number A would be an update by Brian Kasmarski. Proceed. Hey, do you mind being a flat shifter for somebody? Um, the one that you're on right now, but yep, right there. All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, come and speak to you about people. This is a repeat of a presentation that I did in the environmental. Sciences. Uh, there may be a few updates on some of the data points. Uh, I'll mention those, emphasize those, and we'll get to that. Um, the concern about hog farms in the city. Okay, we know livestock, you know, animals. The concern about hogs is their genome. Okay. Um, of the domesticated animals that the agricultural industry uses, which is that what I'm talking about? Sorry, didn't mean to be rude. Um, the the genetic makeup of the hog is more closely related to the human genetic makeup than the other animals within the agricultural industry. So, long story short, the potential for human viruses or human diseases to get into a pig or a hog and mix with viruses or diseases that hogs have is more likely than with other animals. Um, and so that's called, it's a zoonotic disease. It's an animal that, or it's a disease that can be transferred from humans to animals and vice versa. Um, and we've seen that before with um, H5N1 um, and, and things like that. You can, you can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. So a little bit about CAFOs, I think most people understand what CAFOs are. I think the key takeaway on CAFOs is they're identified by animal units, and the number of animal units varies based on the size of the animal. Next slide. Some of the possible impacts, and, and these are really not debatable facts. I think all of the research out there will come to the same conclusion about these potential impacts, changes in air quality. There is debate on how you measure that in terms of a CAFO, um, the, the types of equipment that you use, the um, validity of the equipment that you use, and the experience and the training of the people that are using that equipment. Uh, increased odor and noise complaints, changes in land use, so that would potentially impact zoning. Groundwater and surface water quality changes, lots of data and research out there. The DNR is kind of taking the lead on the groundwater portion. Damage to local roads from increased heavy traffic. A lot of that has to do with the transportation of the animals and the transportation of the waste to neighboring fields um, so that it can be distributed. And then the impact on quantity and quality of nearby drinking wells. So the majority of that data really largely is not debatable. Next slide. Some of the airborne effects, um, the ones that I think are of most importance for human impact are highlighted in red. So ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and then what are referred to as endotoxins. Those are the ones that most health officials work at and there's a causal direct relationship to negative health outcomes with those particular chemicals. Next slide, please. Um, in doing some research for the presentation, I came across a study out of North Carolina, and what they were trying to study there is um, the life expectancy and then some of the other um, potential causes of early mortality, and what this study determined that in North Carolina communities that were located near hog cafos, and they had geographic parameters around that, they noted higher all-cause and in infant mortality, mortality due to anemia, kidney disease, tuberculosis, septicemia, and higher hospital admissions or emergency department visits of low birth weight infants. A real key point on that one is the low birth weight infants. Low birth weight infants has a extremely high 
correlation to poorer health outcomes of those babies, including early mortality. Uh, next slide, please. This one, I, I wanted to mention this one because early on in the CAFO debate, um, the antibiotic issue, antibiotic resistance and the antibiotics getting into groundwater and things like that was a big issue, but I want to draw your attention to the middle there in blue. Um, this practice is no longer legal under the Veterinarian Feed Directive of 2017. So it was an issue, no longer is an issue because it's been remediated. Next slide. A Duke University study in 2017 tried to mimic something similar to what North Carolina did. Um, and so they, they looked at CAFOs versus the control group areas of the state that didn't have uh, close proximity to, to CAFOs. And what they determined on this one, I'll jump down to the bullet points first and then come back up to the, to the significance. The causal links to increased rates of, of anemia, so we saw that in both studies now, low birth weight and asthma, and then higher rates of maternal mortality. And I, I thought that this was a relevant one to, to share with the group in terms of the significance of this particular study. So the odds ratio is a, an odds ratio is a way to determine if a scientific study is valid. An odds ratio of one or above consider, uh, considers that science would look at that and say that that's a valid study. Okay? Um, uh, odds ratio of zero is basically neutral. You may get the outcome that you want of that study. You may not get the outcome of that. A one is, think of one as like 100%. Okay? Um, the other piece of that is that 95% level of significance of significance, that means if, if this study were replicated again, there's a 95% chance that they would come to the exact same outcome. Okay? So it's significant. Next slide. A few things that I, that I got off of, um, uh, public radio and other jurisdictions within Wisconsin, talking to some uh, health officials in those jurisdictions that are further down the road uh, on this than Polk County is. Um, you know, a lot of national organizations, at least in the, the healthcare realm, are calling for the moratorium, similar to what Polk County has enacted. Um, and then I just want to highlight a growing body of evidence shows how CAFOs are directly associated, not only with occupational, so the workers within the CAFOs, um, it's the community around them as well, as well as the social and economic decline of rural communities. So healthcare, there, there's some direct links, I think, that have been established. But healthcare also acknowledges and recognizes that there's still a lot we don't know, and that's why the, 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 the concept of the moratorium is give us time to do more research is really what it boils down to. Next slide. Um, some of the other jurisdictions that I looked into in terms of their health impact assessments, what they've done around uh, this particular topic, and I've, I've shared links. This is all public information, um, but Rock County, Green County, Pepin County, um, in, in our area, Kiwani, there's a lot of other jurisdictions that are out there. What I'm finding is there's some nuances in the outcomes that they're identifying out of these studies, but largely the major takeaways are the same. Seven County, I just wanted to point to that one. They have a similar moratorium that they're still in right now. Um, I think they're working. They contracted with the DNR to um, help them with their particular study as well. Some of the recommendations out of Kiwani, and, and I would mirror these for, for Polk County, but just we need to study more. We need, we need to do not only a retrospective study of, of the capos that already exist, but a prospective study of this is what we know now, and then we need to follow it for a period of time. Um, develop guidance that defines and explains substantial compliance. I think some of the people uh, in public comment talked about the DNR acknowledging that they don't have enough capacity to be able to do the monitoring of these facilities, that's accurate. We've spoken with the DNR as well, and they acknowledge that as a shortfall. Um, some of the resources and technology basically gets into the monitoring equipment. How are we going to monitor air? How are we going to monitor water and particulates? And then the staffing, the, the piece around the DNR and the other regulation entities that are out there. Slide, please. So, kind of a long story short, um, 
what I've seen in a lot of, of the research and, again, areas of the country that are further along in this process, um, we need to establish surveillance programs. We need to monitor the surveillance programs. We need to determine what our thresholds would be to say, all right, the level of this is getting too high, and then what type of mitigation would we recommend or what type of intervention would we recommend. That goes not only for air quality but water quality as well. Um, processes to be able to remove out of our wastewater, do we need to enhance processes in that because of the volume of particulates that these facilities might um, emanate? Best practices around pollution prevention, uh, mitigation, if there's a breach, you know, the sheer volume of waste that would come out of these facilities, if there's a breach, that's a significant issue. That's an environmental issue. And then education as, to the extent possible so that our decision makers um, can make their decisions and, and their votes um, with as much possible information as they have. And that's really kind of a high-level overview of the presentation that we did for the Environmental Services Committee. Um, I would open it up for questions or comments or clarifications at this time. Mr. Chair, uh, Mike Pritchard. Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. We can hear you, Mr. Pritchard. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very, very much, Brian, for that presentation. And uh, 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 I was able to go through uh, the slides, and I, uh, one in particular that I – uh, focused on was uh, uh, National Association of County and City Health Officials, National State, State Policy, which I believe was supporting, uh, they had uh, seven bullet points of what they were uh, supporting on that, and I thought it was well written and well stated. And uh, the question I had really is, could you take a moment to go back and uh, talk about the staff procedure to date and what what you're looking at uh, going forward from today, as far as uh, uh, the, what what you will. Uh, come up with a timetable maybe and uh, uh, what further steps would be presented for the county board? Mr. Pritchard, I assume you're referring to what is our current capacity within environmental health in terms of well, the ability to monitor? Well, I, I suppose that's certainly a factor and in two respects, both goes to the uh, uh, capacity to for work, for generating work product and the other is uh, 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 if there's anything coming out of this that might, uh, I think some of the public comment referred to, uh, and you referred to the transferability of <laughs> disease from zoosity, uh, is it, from the animals to humans and humans to animals and uh, uh, how that enters into it. But uh, I, I know uh, uh, that the health side is a very important aspect of uh, looking at CAFOs and, and uh, where we go from here. And uh, I was wondering how, how if, if you are currently working, you and your staff colleagues are currently working uh, on uh, matters right now uh, 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 at this point and, and hoping to uh, have some uh, work product uh, coming out uh, somewhere down the line? Well, I think um, depending on, the, you know, the decisions that are made, we may end up being the agency that is responsible for, for monitoring um, and enforcement of whatever um, regulations might be in place. That would be in conjunction with DNR and other agencies. Um, based on staffing that we have right now, um, we would need increased capacity in order to be able to do that. There would be definitely an uptick in the uh, frequency of monitoring these entities, as well as um, in the research I've done has noted that jurisdictions that have these types of facilities, they definitely get more calls, okay? Calls, complaints um, um, that necessitate going out and conducting investigations. So there would be that piece to it. 
Um, the other piece to it would be we currently within our agency, within the health department, we don't have the monitoring tools to currently be able to go out and do the monitoring that would be required, or at least that is being recommended at this point, specifically the air monitoring tools. So that would be uh, an area where we would need um, to look at. Thank you for your question, Supervisor Richard. And uh, Brian, I certainly want to thank you uh, for your, your dedication and uh, everything you brought. I, I think your vision of what some of the consequences could be is, uh, is just uh, unbelievable. You've certainly done things that are really above your job description, and I uh, certainly appreciate it. Um, Supervisor Pritchard, I think you, you remember, oh, probably about six months ago, you know, he and our person spoke to our county board about uh, yeah, his Jackson, out of Baldwin. Yes, out of Baldwin, his responsibilities. So as to uh, agriculture, uh, uh, in uh, animal agriculture, he, uh, the responsibility he has on dairy hogs and all that. And he, too, emphasized how short of staff and uh, uh, the, uh, the problem. So I think things were covered very well. Brian, thanks again, and congratulations on all the work you do in, in this field. Moving on to a B uh, painful presentation from December 11th, uh, 2019, Fire Services Committee. Yeah, so uh, I, I want to thank you for covering all that and mentioning the presentation you did at the Environmental Service Committee. I, I guess my question, if I can uh, kind of follow up on it, it is staff, uh, uh, are, are there some additions that will be made to the research that has been conducted up till now? I, I would, my answer to that would likely be yes. I know we have asked the Environmental Services Committee um, to let us know what other types of information they may need. I believe the Environmental Services Committee as is working on preparing a template report or kind of a final report for that group to review. So the answer to that is is yes. Um, I will continue to monitor the research that, that I've been looking at, particularly the Duke and North Carolina study because those are still active studies. Um, and then we'll base our further research off of the requests and the needs of both this group, the environmental services group, as well as the county board if they have any other information that they would like. But will there be a presentation to the entire county board? I believe that would be up to the county board, but I'd be more than happy to participate. I think I guess so. service is the only committee that meets twice a month, uh, and so they're, they're certainly aware of this uh, circumstance. Well, I, I guess what I'm thinking is that at some point there would be some recommendations as to what steps, the, if any, the county might take. And I do think that our Health and Human Services Board should be uh, involved in that process. And uh, I thank you very, very much for your presentation today. You're welcome. Um, I'll just take a minute or two to provide an update on, on the COVID response, COVID-2019 uh, response. Um, obviously, everybody's aware that you can't get away from the, the media in terms of everything that's happening. Um, some of the Polk County-specific data, um, usually due to delays in reporting, the data that we report is about one day old. So this is from Monday. Um, Polk County has, we've dealt with our, in our nursing section in terms of surveillance and investigation. We've completed 140 cases that ended up being negative. That means you were either tested and a negative result came back, or they were in a isolation or quarantine for a 14-day period, which is what's recommended by the CDC, and they came out of that um, free and clear, so to speak. So 140 negatives. We have 28 that are currently being monitored. Unfortunately, we've had three positive cases. 
um, and we're continuing to monitor. Um, at the peak, I don't want to say that the peak is over, but at the height of, of the response so far to date within Polk County, we were monitoring somewhere in the low 40s, and it's since started to trickle down to what you see upper 20s, lower 30s on a regular basis. Um, our main focus continues to be on uh, early identification, early isolation, making sure that the people that are isolated or quarantined um, have what they need in order to be able to remain isolated and quarantined. And if their condition necessitates that they need medical care, that we um, make sure we um, coordinate that connection in an appropriate way so that the people that are going to the healthcare facilities are not putting others at risk. And that may be going in alternate entries. Um, our healthcare facilities do a great job of infection control. Um, that's one of our consistent messages with the public is call ahead uh, before you report, and that way the, the clinic or the emergency department can implement their protocols to make sure that there's not cross-contamination. I will mention um, one of the three positive cases was hospitalized. The person had oh. recovered and has um, been released from the hospital, so that's good news. Any questions or comments on that? Was that a question for me? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear it. Okay, I'll assume not. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Hey, Brian, this is Nick Larson speaking. Hi, Nick. Hi. Yeah. How are you today? Um, when this is happening, you know, with, with the social distancing that we have now, um, is we're going to have testing and, uh, and the inspections that we have to when it eases? Are we going to have testing and that, or uh, how is that going to be handled? One of the protocols, um, Mr. Larson, for easing the social distancing and starting to hopefully get back to a sense of normalcy is one of the triggers for allowing that to happen is enough testing to be able to test an adequate number of people so that we can monitor potential spread as we start to loosen those restrictions. So it's one of the thresholds that we look at in terms of actually pulling the trigger on using those social distancing guidelines. So if you follow New York at all, New York is starting to talk a little bit about, you know, they've passed their apex and coming on a downward trend. And, of course, the question is, well, do we reopen the economy and then do we get people out and living their lives again? They need to be able to ensure that they have the testing capacity that if necessary, they can send upwards to 80 to 90 percent of the population, and that's the way that they can measure that the virus is still being contained and they start to work towards herd immunity. Okay, thanks. Do we have enough enough tests that we can do it? How much do we have to, in order to test all these people? At, at this point in time in Polk County, I would say no. It's not that there's not testing happening within our healthcare facility. It is limited. So Polk County, and I would say Wisconsin in general, uh, not that we're a unique, a unique state by any means, um, but we are we have limited testing. So we have um, tiers for testing right now, and that means only the most severe, those with the most symptoms, are those that are at the most risk are getting the testing. Other people are not receiving that testing. Um, because it's being deemed more critical for those, that tier one group. I have a question. Uh, how, about, how about personnel that have uh, contact with some of these people? Are you talking health care workers? Yes. Um, depending on their, their level of risk, they would be considered a close contact, and if their level of risk is low, moderate, or high, there's um, recommended guidelines for them as well. They may be forced into a, a period of isolation and quarantine as well. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Brian. Yep, thank Thanks you. Again.
Tanya, do you okay. want to address uh, number eight, uh, number seven matters for our next meeting, which will be on Tuesday, May 12th? Yeah, so on um, the um, work plan, we have a pretty heavy agenda for May. A lot of um, work in April. We just haven't gotten the time to be able to do that with the, the COVID-19 happening, the pandemic. Um, so I ended up shifting a lot into May. Um, I don't even know if we'll have a legislative event. Um, so if we do, we'll report out on that. Um, 2021 budget priorities discussion. I'd like to have that as a tentative based on where we're at with um, Department of Administration and um, state uh, We'll go over our um, Health and Human Services accomplishments for 2019. We will have a preliminary end of year financial report. I'll tell you right now, it's looking pretty good um, uh, based on the numbers that I've received from my sister staff. And then uh, we will bring back the child wellness for the, the vaping and the sex that we have been working on. Also, for um, supervisor requests, we will have a presentation on the housing study, the results of that. And then we will begin some discussion on public transportation um, as it relates to what that would look like in Polk County. Um, Talk about Uber services, van services, options for non-disabled elderly, full cost and discounted transportation, and then the possibility of a transportation study. And anything else I can find to fit in that to work. <laughs> I think it will be pretty good. Uh, Bill Oliva or uh, Dr. Nagas, uh, Rita McKee, or anybody else on the committee, do you have any comments? And uh, Rita, thank you for your your help, uh, your nursing experience, and, and uh, helping out in our health situation. Any other comments? I no uh, we'll do uh, add something. I had a comment. So, Rita, if you guys don't know, Rita um, came and helped us do our N95 fittings for all of our law enforcement special workers. Um, so, she was a champ at, at coming in and helping out with that. So, we want to thank her for that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here to help. We can hear you. I'm here to help. Oh, thanks, Rita. Great presentation. Dr. Loggins, Dr. Uh, Bill, or anybody else, do you have any other comments? Oh, is there something uh, on, a, on a couple issue at, on your board level? I don't know. That's a good question, Dr. Lagas. Uh, we'll proceed to work on that. It was a question that came from the end. Yeah. yeah, it was a question. We do, we do have an extension uh, in, in uh, progress right now. It has passed the couple well, that's, that's good. Okay, if there is any other comments, I think it's been a really informative meeting. And, uh, we'll uh, meet again May 12th, 10 a.m. Uh, just a big thanks to the Health and Human Services uh, Board and to the, all the people at uh, you and your staff. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Larson, second. Thanks, John, for all you do. <laughs> Thank you for your service again, Larson. You're going to be, be retiring, and uh, your uh, your job is uh, being a full time Badger fan. <laughs> For sure, John, for sure. Okay, everybody in favor of uh, the motion? Say aye. 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 Thanks again, and good luck and good health, everybody. Good health. Thank you. <laughs>